Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Virtual Parenting Experience 2022. I'm Stan Bassan, and I'm about to do a presentation on the issue of hijackings and children in your car. When it comes to the issue of hijacking and children, it is, in my mind at least, extremely important that there is enough information shared within the space and of obviously the time limit that I've got, but also in such a way that people are in a position to take away some knowledge and to help them prepare their mind for the inevitable and the most disturbing event that could potentially occur to them. Now, uh, car hijackings, we see almost every single year, we see these news reports talking about uh, hijackings escalating and more and more hijackings happening. And many people tend to for lack of a better term, live in an environment where they kind of believe that these kinds of things will typically not perhaps happen to them. And we often hear of these events and invariably and unfortunately, the further away they happen from us, uh, the less they tend to affect us. As an example, in Detroit in USA, a 14-month-old child was taken. This happened in April just this year. The mother left the car running while she quickly ran into a hair salon and the car was stolen with the child inside. In her case, the child was fortunately dropped in the sidewalk and the child was reunited with the parents. But you can imagine the, the impact it must have on a mother to make a decision in the moment that's a very quick and very short and returning to, the, to where the car is supposed to be and to find that the car is missing with the child inside. So that's certainly disturbing. But we could argue that this is America and there's a lot of crime in America and there's a lot of these kinds of things happening and it feels far away from what we are dealing with. In May 2022, just a few days ago in Grabo, South Africa, a two-year-old boy was taken. In his case, he was actually in the transport, in a scholar transport vehicle that got hijacked. Fortunately, again, the car was recovered by police and the child, and, and, and so with the child as well. Now, it was this incident that prompted, um, let's call it the dis decision for me to do this presentation and to prepare something to take you away with. We most certainly know that no mother, no father, no parent wants to even consider or entertain the notion that their car might be taken by force or by whatever mechanism with their child still being inside. That is extremely disturbing and obviously not something that anybody would willingly or happily want to endure. Now, in the South African context, we are talking about hijacking specifically. I'm going to leave the issues of vehicles left abandoned and children forgotten and cars, etc., and focus exclusively on the issue of hijackings. And I, in my mind, at, at the very least, it's important that people understand what hijackings are like, what impact and effect they will have on them, how they should respond to them, what to consider in the effort to try and avoid them and to prevent them, and more importantly, how they should act when a hijacking happens. Now, it's common cause that in South Africa we have high crime rates uh, and that these crimes are on the rise on a regular basis. But as these events start moving closer to home, as it starts happening to people you know, or happening in your city or town, uh, you know, or your environment, uh, we start becoming much more aware. And to that, I'd like to take you through some ideas. And one of the first things I want to cover that I think people should be aware of is the issue of the actual experience of getting hijacked. And to that, we are talking about the issue of the responses that your body will go through when you're involved in a confrontational event. Now, you will go into so-called fight or flight mode. In this mode, you have a propensity to respond uh, to your environment in physiological ways as well as mental ways. And essentially what happens is you go through an extreme adre adrenaline rush, your muscles tense up, you start feeling weak, your legs start quivering, your digestive system shuts down so your stomach feels pitted and hollow, your heart rate just fires through the sky, your heart feels like it's jumping out of your, your chest, and your bladder muscles might even relax. So you feel like you, and this is literally what happens in extreme, extreme circumstances, is that people even urinate. And this is because of the extreme stress that's put on your body. Now, this mechanism that affects you is divided into three categories. People tend to respond to these high stress environments in one of three ways. They would either freeze, meaning they shut down completely and they don't respond at all. They literally just let things happen. They might flee. Uh, we call this the flight. And they might actually try and run away. We've actually seen videos on the internet where, where mothers left their children and physically ran away from the child in, in an incident. 
And then, of course, some people have a, has a, have a pretens, uh, propensity to fight or to fight back or to respond physically. Each of these have their own risks associated with them. If you freeze, of course, you might be thrown out of your vehicle and the car might leave before you even realize that your child has been taken. If you flee and you don't include your child in the fleeing process, you don't grab your child in the process, you might run away and leave your child abandoned. And of course, since most hijackings inc include or involve armed attackers, if you try to fight, you might actually expose yourself to additional risk and potentially get shot. And even worse, one of your children might be struck during that. So it's a very, very, very emotional, difficult uh, situation to deal with. And what can we do about it? Now, the things that are available to you as a common citizen, I'm not talking about trained police officers. I'm not talking about qualified people with some kind of military or police background. I'm talking about all security officers, police officers, whatever. I'm talking about the general citizen, perhaps a mother or father, on the way home from school or work that get confronted with these situations. One of the first things you could potentially do is to run away. In that moment, you will pretty much be like prey and the attacker or the hijacker will very much be like a predator. Your first instinct will, tr will most likely be to try and flee from the situation. Most people with children in the car think about their children. They try to get to or grab their children and they try and run away from the situation. It is true that this can, uh, or this is often included in advice, and that the best advice people can give is cooperate, or don't resist, uh, rather run away, etc. But it's very complicated because sometimes people have a propensity to become defensive and to actually act in response to the attack. Now, how you act in response to that attack is what we'd like to cover very briefly. One of the big issue, issues is that I believe that you should... First of all, you should get some kind of training. You should have a goal of getting your children into some kind of training. I'm not talking about toddlers and, and, and babies and stuff. I'm talking about children that are old enough to learn to respond. Whether you do karate classes or something like that is, of course, uh, up to you. What it does is I don't want you to, to have your children go to classes to learn to fight on your behalf if they're five, six, seven, and eight years old or even 15 years old. What I want them to learn is to react to situations, to react to the physiological responses of stress, and to be trainable, to have the mental discipline to train. If you are inclined towards that and you feel like it's worth it, you could consider an actual vehicle shooting course for yourself or some kind of physical defensive training like Krav Maga, where you can take the family as a whole, the husband, the wife, and everybody, and train you. You don't have to learn to fight so that you can fight. You can also learn to fight or to respond to a, a combat situation by adapting your mindset and being able and capable of reacting in the moment, even if that reaction is fleeing or avoiding conflict. People who have no training, people who have no experience and no anticipation are very prone to doing nothing or just complying. If you go to the Arrive Alive website, there are a number of little videos and educational things you can find to start giving you a background on how hijackers think, the strategies they use. But today, we don't want to go too much into that because I want to get to the good stuff, and that is what you must do and how you should act. We all know about so-called hijacking hotspots. We know where they are, and we know that we see these signs on the road. But the problem is you cannot only expect hijackings to happen where those signs are installed. Because the fact is that almost every single hijacking that has happened, every secret, single person I've looked at, every investigation we've done for our clients who, whose uh, staff have been involved in hijackings, they all do the same thing or they report the same kind of sequence of events. They typically say that it's extremely sudden. It comes completely with surprise. We hear things like they came out of nowhere, the next minute he appeared, when I heard the smash and look, there was already something and people are caught by surprise. So it's extremely important that you live in a state of anticipation. You must literally program yourself to be on the constant lookout for these kinds of events. There are often firearms involved, which means that you cannot use your physical body or yourself to resist. It's risky and it's not necessarily, uh, you know, there's no guarantee of the outcome. Most people are scared and try to shy away from confrontation 
in that moment, it can delay you, it can incapacitate you, and it exposes your children to danger. So by doing some kind of training as a family, you get into a position where your mind gets trained to respond in situations, and then you can decide what to do in that response, such as fleeing or saving your children. Normally, uh, hijackers tend to trap your vehicle or box in your vehicle. They stop behind you, or they uh, trap you in traffic, or they stop you in your driveway as you're arriving home. So you've got to anticipate any area where there's a possibility that you can be boxed in as a possible hijacking zone. As a good example, we have an aerial photograph of traffic in Cape Town, South Africa. If you look up traffic, nobody thinks much about it. It's when you go a little bit closer and you watch the vehicles that you notice that most vehicles are so close together that if anybody had to try to escape in the moment, they would have nowhere to go. We have two vehicles that are at least in a better position. The one towards the front is in a position where you can turn to the side and, and run between vehicles if he tries to escape from the hijack. And the one to the rear or the bottom left of the image has enough space in front of him and a free lane. So when you stop at an intersection, try and pick a point where you have free lanes to your sides try and stop as far away from the vehicle in front of you as would be it would make it possible for you to find an escape route so if you see anybody approaching or attempting to hijack you or attempting to approach you with aggression you can uh, at least launch an escape when you're sitting in your vehicle with with children especially with toddlers and babies keep in mind that you in this case illustrated by the yellow seat the seat typically where you are sitting in the driver's position the seat over which you have the most control is your passenger seat directly in front. In that passenger seat is where I'd like to see your child, your children, or even your baby toddler with a seat facing backwards, so that in the moment, it's a very short motion or a very quick event for you to try to respond and to rescue the child as you exit the vehicle. Keep in mind also that what you would like to do at this stage, if there is a hijacking event, is to buy the maximum amount of time. To do this, it's always a good idea to switch off or turn off your vehicle if you cannot escape the situation. That way you are delaying uh, the inevitable departure of your vehicle and you have an opportunity to save your child or children for that matter. With you, when you look at the seats to the rear of your vehicle, it's very difficult to respond to those seats really rapidly. So when you have children sitting at the rear that are old enough, they should be trained to know to escape the vehicle immediately in response to a command you might give. You might say, let's all run or let's go or hijack or attack or whatever. You decide and you practice with your family to that extent. When you exit your vehicle, if you do have children in the rear, it's better to always have them seated behind you or closest to you so it's the shortest possible path to rescue. So when you have one child in the car, either have them sit to the front next to you. If there's any reason why they cannot sit there, there might be a baby. You want to have that child directly behind you so it's a short distance for you. Jump out of your door, open their door and get them out. If you have to run all the way around your car, the front or the back, the fact is that you're going to delay the period during which the hijacking takes place and the hijacker might be in the seat and already moving off before you reach them. So that's something to consider. Don't forget about power of your voice. When an hijacker attacks your vehicle, or if an hijacker attacks your vehicle, and you have any children in the vehicle, it is extremely important that you use your voice, that you shout, that you say, I've got children, or my child, or my children, or the kids, I want to get the kids. The attacker must know, people can potentially hear, help could be alerted, but you want the attacker to understand that you, that you are expecting some kind of transaction, for lack of a better term. You can have my car, if I can have my kids. And in most cases where these happen, it often happens that the children are, are, are released with the parents. But of course, we know that it's not necessarily going to be the case. After a hijacking, you are invariably going to be a witness in some kind of criminal incident, or you're going to have to be giving a report in that regard. To that, the best witness you can be will be based on your observations at the time. Now, when human beings are exposed to situations they typically get something called threat fixation. This is where they focus only on the firearm or the gun, and they tend to get tunnel vision, and they tend to kind of become numb to the world. It's extremely important that you understand that this is going to happen and that you practice to look and act in response for your children, to protect your children. Now, when you're involved in an event, you're going to be asked questions. Different people recall and recollect incidents and events differently. Some people are auditory, they, they remember what they hear. Some people are visual, they remember images. Some people are emotional or, or, or generic or kinesthetic for that matter, and they respond to the feelings they had in the, in the situation. And some people are very analytical, they tend to try to understand everything. 
when you try to compile a version or to tell somebody what happened, be aware of this. Think to yourself, what did I hear? What did I see? How did I feel? What did I think? Break it down into components so that you share the maximum amount of information possible. When it comes to identifying the actual attacker or trying to give a narrative about what happened and who the attacker was, most people think that it's about remembering their faces and identifying them in the lineup, but there's more to it than that. In an ideal world, you must also use your ears and listen very carefully. Listen to the way they speak. Listen to the language they use. Listen whether they are on phones or getting calls or speaking to anybody else. Listen to the way in which they speak because that might give us clues as to what exactly their intentions were, where they came from, etc. Look at how tall people are as well. Relative to yourself, you don't have to judge their height. When an attacker pulls you out of the car, there's going to be a period when you and the attacker are close to each other. Just compare yourself to them and look whether they are taller than you or shorter than you. That gives a lot of information to the investigation authorities. When it comes to firearms, it helps to identify what kind of firearm people had. It's important for you to try and explain the difference between those. Go on the internet, look up revolver, look up pistol, look up rifle, so that you get an idea of what kind of firearm you saw, and you can give the police or the investigative authorities the correct information. These are the steps I'd like you to take as a parting message. First, anticipate. Imagine that things can happen to you. Stop thinking that will only happen in another place or to another person. Focus on the possibility that every time you stop at an intersection, every time you arrive home, every time you're driving out of your driveway, think to yourself, if I wanted to box me in right now, what would I do? So when you arrive home, open your gate in advance so that when you get there, you can see if there are other cars before you drive in. Don't start getting this tunnel vision to get home and forgetting about the environment. Prepare and train. I cannot say this enough. Unfortunately, um, it's not ideal. We wish the world was a better place, but the fact remains you have to undergo training. It's in your own best interest. Even if you just watch training videos and you and your husband and your children just train at home, how do we get out of the car quickly? When I shout attacker, what do, what do you do, Johnny? What do you do, Mary? Where do I go? Where does the husband go? Plan and avoid Every time you use your vehicle, think to yourself, where am I going today? Where am I going to be vulnerable? Where am I going to be stopping? What does it look like in the environment? And perhaps even look at getting yourself, if you are into changing your vehicle at any stage, try for larger vehicles that are, that are easier to use as battering rams if you, if you want. Evade and escape is an important component. Whenever possible, if you think your life is at risk, if you think there's danger, or if you anticipate the possibility of an attack, change your route, drive off, leave the area, change lanes, watch cars around you. If the hijacking happens, cooperate and observe. Rather cooperate, let people take your car, rescue your children, rescue yourself, but at the same time, listen, feel, look, try to see. And of course, if you've got to act and respond, do so quickly, rapidly, and properly based on the training you've done. Within the time space, that's all I have time for, but I hope this has at least given you some kind of insight into the possible things you can do. There are many more, and it's much more varied, but I'm hoping that this has put you in a position to, at the very least, think a little bit about the situation and to try and look at possible things you could do to get out of it. Thank you very much for the time. Enjoy the weekend and the seminar. All of the very best. Safe travels. Please look after your children.